of polymorphism because even though these are all different objects of different types, we get the proper method. So the pet object takes many forms. And that method that we call make sound and get food gets the appropriate method depending on the class that was created. All right. So our inheritance structure is like this. Uh, so the top of the chain was a public abstract class of pet. Public abstract, what does it mean when we say something's an abstract class? Right, we can't instantiate it. So I could not say pet A equals new pet. I can't create an instance of it. In other words, there is no object that is a pet and only a pet. You have to instantiate one of the subclasses of pet. And what we have, we have dog and then lap dog. So dog inherits from cat, and so does lap, and lap do, dog inherits from cat. Dog inherits from pet, and lap dog inherits from dog. Cat inherits from pet, and house cat inherits from cat. So the kind of object that's created determines what version of the function we're going to get. So in this case, we create a dog, we create a lap dog, and we create a house cat, we add all of these pets to our array list. We can do that because pet is um, a superclass of dog, cat, lap dog, house cat, and so on. So I can create one of the subclasses and I can add it to the array list of pets because, after all, a dog is a pet. A dog is a special kind of pet but a dog is a pet. So I can use it any place that I say I can use a pet. All right? Now, when we loop through this, we're going to get the appropriate method for each of the objects based on how they're created. So for the first one, we're going to get the dog's version of make sound and get food. So the dog's version of make sound is going to say bow wow, get food is table scraps, and so on. On the next one, we create a lap dog. The sound is going to say yip yip, and the get food is inherited from dog. So it's not overridden in, in lap dog, therefore, we get no different than from an ordinary dog. Finally, a house cat. The sound is meow and depends on the day. So, again, that's an example of polymorphism. Are we allowed to do this? Can I execute that statement? Yeah. Yes, I can. I can put in a pointer meant for pets a dog because a dog is a pet. Okay? So I can do that. Can I say this, though? Whereas catch frisbee is defined on the dog object and not on the pet object. Can I say that? No. No, we can't. Because the compiler, all the compiler knows is that there's a pet in the variable p. There's a pointer to a pet object in the variable p. So between here and here, now, there's no instructions in our case, but there could be potentially many instructions that changes that, ob you know, that, that gets rid of that object and recreates a new object. All right. All the compiler knows is at this point, 
that P is a, con is a pointer to PAT. And therefore, it only lets you call functions that have been declared on the PAT. It will not let you call any functions that, de that is declared on the DOG that is not also declared on the PAT. All right? But if we call an object that is defined on the PAT, we get the DOG's version of that function. And that's the key thing about polymorphism. All right? Now, we talked about the is a test. And we said that you have a case of inheritance when this is a that, or this is a kind of that. So we could say vehicle and say an automobile. An automobile is a kind of vehicle. And therefore, we could create a class of vehicle and have a subclass from that automobile. Likewise, we could have a bicycle, which is a kind of vehicle. So we could make bicycle a subclass of vehicle, and so on. All right, so that's what we mean when we say the is a test. However, if you think about it, things could be a bunch of things, right? A bicycle, well, maybe not a bicycle, an automobile, all right, is a vehicle, but it's also a thing that has a battery, all right? It's a thing that has a battery. An automobile is also a thing that has seats, all right? What are some other things that have seats? An auditorium, a classroom, a roller coaster. All of these things are things that have seats, all right? So what do you do when you're faced with that? An automobile could be considered a vehicle, or it could be considered a thing with seats. How do you determine what you use for the superclass? Well, absolutely, within the context of the problem that you're trying to solve, all right? The other thing you do is you see what's it more like, all right? What behaviors and property does it have more in common with, all right? A vehicle or other things that have seats. Well, really, when you think of all the things that have seats, for the most part, the only thing they have in common is that they all have seats, right? Yes, a classroom has seats. Yes, a roller coaster has seats. Yes, a auditorium has seats. Yes, a motorcycle has seats. Yes, a automobile has seats. But really, that's where the similarity ends. Whereas automobiles and other vehicles, you could come up with a whole list of similarities that an automobile has with other vehicles, right? An automobile uh, has uh, automobiles and other things have the way that they're powered, all right? They travel distances. They maintain a certain speed. All those things are things that those classes have in common. So within the context of the problem you're trying to solve, you have to decide where you're going to put this on the inheritance chain. You have to say, does this make more sense as being a vehicle or a thing with seats? So there's sort of a is, but there's a stronger and weaker is, right? Um, you know, um, I'm a human being, which is an animal. I'm also something that has a clock on it, right? What are other things that have clocks on it? The classroom wall, Big Ben, uh, and so on down the line. So when you decide, in Java, you have to decide only one thing as a superclass. You can't in have multiple inheritance in Java. That's an important rule to remember. All right? So yes, in the real world, something can be two kinds of things, two different kinds of two different things. But within Java, you have to pick one. And you use the criteria of what does it resemble the most. All right? And would decide that, yeah, I'm, you know, a, a human is uh, probably more like other animals than it's more, than it's like things that have clocks on them, all right? A 
automobile is probably more like other vehicles than it's like things that happens to have seats in it. So you pick the stronger is a relationship and you subclass from that. When you subclass from something, you get two benefits. You get the ability to reuse code and you get the notion of polymorphism. That we can put any pet in these methods and we can ask for it to make a sound and it will work because we know all pets have a make sound method. All right? Because make sound was declared as an abstract class on the pet class, which means that any subclass from it needs to have its own version of make sound. So the house cat has to have a make sound. The dog has to have a make sound. And we can even have it where you don't have to have it. A lap dog doesn't have to have it because it inherits from dog, but we have it declared there. The reason that, you, that multiple inheritance is, is a bad idea is because it would become very complicated to designate what came from what. If you had a, cl uh, a class that inherited from two superclasses, if both of them had a method of draw, for example, which class's method would the subclass take? So if we had a method of draw, then how would the compiler know which class to use draw from if each of the two superclasses had a draw method, or so on and so forth? Let's say one of them had an attribute of age that was an integer, and one of them had an attribute of age that was a double. Well, what is the subclass's attribute for age? Is it a double or is it an integer? All those things become very complicated when you allow for multiple inheritance. So Java took the easy way out and said, no multiple inheritance. All right? Which means that you can only inherit from one class and you only get the benefit of getting the code from one class or one set of classes. All right? You only get that reusability of code. However, the polymorphism aspect of inheritance is a big deal. The ability to put something in to an array list, for example, and treat all the array lists, all the elements in the array list the same, is an important thing. And that's why we have interfaces. All right? Interfaces are Java's workaround for the problem of multiple inheritance. All right? Because multiple inheritance is too troublesome to worry about. All right? Um, what has been implemented is interfaces. An interface is like an abstract class with all abstract methods. If we notice our pet class, we have some attributes, some abstract methods, but we also have a constructor. And we could have the gets and sets for these as well. Let's put those gets and sets in. Public string get name. public int wait get wait and then we could have the sets associated with them as well
So we can have code in our superclasses, and the subclasses share that code. With an interface, though, we don't have any code. We only have abstract functions. Okay? So, let's create a small example. You need to change the voice. Thank you. So an interface is going to look like this. Public interface. And I'll create an interface for has seats. Okay. All I'm going to define for it is two methods. All right. And those two methods are Get how many seats and fits, which accepts an argument of an integer. That fits method is going to return a true if a certain number of people would fit in that place that has seats. Otherwise, it's going to return false. OK. So that's all we create when we create an interface. We create some abstract methods. We don't have to say those methods are abstract because that's known because it's an interface. So I'm going to go and save this. Now, I'm going to implement that interface by creating a another um, another um, class for auditorium. Okay? Public class auditorium. I'm going to create a private int called capacity.
and I'm going to create a constructor. That is going to set the capacity to the argument. Now, an auditorium is something that has seats, right? But we've said that we probably don't want to, well, we created an interface for that. We have not created a class for that. Therefore, we don't extend the superclass. We implement the interface. So I'm going to say public class auditorium implements has seats. I'm going to create a couple more functions here. Let's see what it means when we define something as implementing an interface. So I'm going to save this as auditorium. And I'm going to try to compile it. So there's my two classes, and I try to compile them. I'm going to get a couple of errors. Auditorium is not abstract and does not override a abstract method fits int and has seats. OK? Here's what it means when we define something as as, an, as implementing an interface. What that means is that every method that's defined in the interface has to exist in the class that implements the interface. All right. So it complained that I didn't have fits. I'm surprised it didn't give me an error on the other one as well. But I guess one is blowing it up. One's enough to blow it up, so it only gives me one error. Now, here's how it works. The interface is a contract. What do I mean by a contract is you're, comp you're promising the compiler that you're going to have these methods so that I can use this, anything that implements from this interface, I can use it anywhere that something that has seats is needed. All right, I can plug in a thing of uh, an object of type auditorium anywhere where something that's defined as something having seats can be used. So what I have to do is I have to actually write an actual concrete method for these two methods in the interface. So anything I implement, any class I create that implements has seats, has to have these two methods in them. 
or one of the superclasses of them. But we'll keep it simple on one level. So I seats method, and I method that says would this number of people fit in this place that has seats. So how many seats? Well, that's the capacity. So I'm going to return the capacity. The interface doesn't care how we write that function or what that function looks like. It only cares that that function has been defined. So in this case, over an auditorium, answering the question of how many seats it has, well, there's an attribute for that. We're going to create a, uh, a, a room class, all right, where the size of the, uh, of the room depends on what type of room it is. An office has a capacity of two people, all right, or three people. A lecture room has a, a capacity of, um, let's say, 24 people, all right. A lab has a capacity of 24 people. A lecture hall has a capacity of 100 people. So it doesn't matter how we calculate the capacity. We need to be able to simply return a function that says how many people can fit in that place. And fits will be simply if capacity is greater than the argument, then return true. else return false. So now, this will compile. All right. What's the difference between the two? Well, we added any of the methods defined in the interface we, uh, we added to the auditorium because we said that that auditorium class implements this interface. So that's what it means when we implement it, when we implement an interface. Let me create a new class for room. And let's say we don't have a, a capacity. We have instead a room type, which is a string. Now, how many seats? We don't have a room capacity to return. Instead, we add the rule that I said before. If type equals office, then Seats equals three. Yeah, you can probably fit three people in most offices.
if office equals classroom, seats equals 24. If type equals lab, seats equals 24. Finally, if type equals lecture hall, seats equals 100. Will it fit? Well, if get number of seats is greater than the argument, then we return true, otherwise we return false. Now notice, a get seats, get how many seats method. It doesn't matter what that involves. When we implement an interface, we're not saying how we're going to implement that. It doesn't matter the fact that this, for a room, how many seats we have depends on the type of room it is. And for an auditorium, we simply have the capacity of the room stored as an attribute. Because it's an interface, all we care is that there's some method on any class that implements that interface that says get how many seats and we'll re return back how many seats that has. Likewise, we don't care the details of whether it fits or not. All right? We simply care that we give it the argument and we'll get back a boolean of whether that number of people would fit in that place or not. Excuse me. So let's write a test class for this. What's that? Okay, cool, thanks. All right, so let's make a test class. Oh, let me save this one first. So, I'm going to create one of each. Room R equals new room. Office. Auditorium. A equals new auditorium say it seats a hundred people yes I did
All right. This is my test code. I'm just going to run it to make sure it works. This really doesn't do anything earth shattering. It doesn't even really show us interfaces. All right. Okay. This doesn't really show us anything about interfaces. Because I simply have two classes that happen to share the same method name. All right? This would work whether there was an interface or not, in other words. As long as I had to find a get how many seats in room, get how many seats in auditorium. But by having an interface and insisting that both of these implement that interface, I've guaranteed that both of these have a method called get how many seats. Which means I can do this. I can act in a polymorphic way. I can create an, an array list of has seats, my interface. I can create my array list. I can I can loop through and say the first thing that's on my array list, the i thing, tell me how many seats you have. No, Sierra says, reached end of file while parsing. What that means is it's looking for something that it hasn't gotten and it hit the end of the file. What's it looking for? In many cases, it's looking for one of them brackets.
it tells us the first one has a capacity of 3, the second one has a capacity of 100. Why can I do that? I can do that because my array list I've defined as having things that have seats, things that have implemented the has seats interface. Because I've implemented it to have things in the has seats interface, I know that every one of those objects that implement that has seats interface will have in it the get how many seats method. Right? Because remember, if that's not in there, we're going to get a compile error. By virtue of us saying that this implements has seats, we know for sure that all these methods that are defined on the has seats interface are going to be implemented for this object. The auditorium object and the room object. It may be done totally different ways as we've seen. In one way there was simply a number that said how many seats are in the auditorium. In the case of a room there's a little series of if statements. So depending on the type of room that's how many seats are in it. All right, But we know for sure because both those classes implement the has seats interface that we can use any of those objects anywhere where a has seat member is needed. So we can put that in the array list, we can loop through it, and we can call the has seats method, get how many seats method. All right? And we know that that's going to return a number because we've defined those as implementing an interface. And it works polymorphically. Right? The room used its formula to calculate how many seats. The uh, auditorium used its rule for calculating how many seats. This doesn't seem like a good idea, or this doesn't seem like as good as it is until you've actually gotten in and started using it. But knowing that something fits a certain criteria, and by criteria I mean knowing that there's a function declared somewhere for this class, allows us to treat these things polymorphically and handle a bunch of things using one common function. All right? Is polymorphism always accomplished through array lists? No, this is, just a, this is the easiest way to demonstrate it. Any, any method that would use a, a class could show polymorphism. It wouldn't have to be in a loop. This, the, the loop is just an obvious case of it because we can see one member of the array, it shows us one way of doing the calculation. The other member of the array, it shows us a different way of doing the calculation. So it's obvious that we're getting different forms for the same thing. We have something that's defined as has seats, and yet we get the results in a very different way. Or we have something defined as a pet, yet the pets all make different sounds because the specific kind of pet varied. That's an interface. All right. What I plan on doing next time is talking a little bit about your homework assignment. Going over, reviewing these rules, and talking about your assignment that involves interfaces. All right. Any question right now? All right. Let me gather these files and I'll be upstairs to let you in lab.